Okay. I'm consenting to being recorded. Let's get going. Um, so thanks everyone for being here for our Vonnegut uh, Roundtable. Um, we're here at the 2021 American Literature Association Zoom style. Um, I am currently in my aunt and uncle's basement. Uh, I am doing a family visit. And so <laughs> as these things go during uh, pandemic times, um, I think this is, you know, one of the good, good outcomes, right? Could worst places to be. In any case, um, we're going to go in the order listed in uh, the program here. And I think maybe we'll just go through everybody. Um, and Tom says every presenter should also provide whatever biographical info you like. We're quite casual. That is true. Um, so yeah, so I'll just, um, you know, name, give you a cue. It's your turn to go, whatever biographical info you'd like to share. Um, we'll, we'll have about eight minutes per person. Nothing, you know, super strict on that, but eight minutes-ish. And then I, I think when we get to the end of everybody, let's let's wait to do our, our kind of discussion until everybody's had their chance to give give their their presentation yeah okay uh, so with with that all said uh, Angie would you please yes. take it away you you mean share the screen or mute sorry oh if you are ready uh, to share oh, yeah, your yeah. screen then yeah, yeah. Go, go right ahead please Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? No. No. Uh, wait a second. Wait a second, please. Uh, okay. Yes. Can yes. See? Yeah. Good. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Oh, sorry. Good. Good evening. Uh, my topic is why am I still alive in Slaughterhouse Five? And my name is Andrew, I'm from National Taiwan Normal University. So the publication date of this novel is on March 31st, 1969. And the historical background is after the Second World War. And it is about a man called uh, Billy Pilgrim and he has a so-called PTSD, post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. So it's actually a fiction about traumatic memory, fantasy, and a continuous time span in a similarly rational interpretation. And in the setting, Billy, after the war, he has a boy and a girl. And Billy's daughter, Barbara, said that her dad's uh, saying is just crazy and it's, none of it is true. So it's a typical reaction when you reckon someone you love is mad is that what he says is just true is it's, it's not none of it's not true it's just a kind of nonsense of lies and as you see on in the slide there is a Billy's fantasy that is called Trafalgar door it's a sign of the nonsense lies in to the public so actually Billy's experience of coming is to unstuck in time that can be viewed as some syndrome very similar at, like the schizophrenia, actually. So what does uh, this symbol mean? You can see the photo, enjoy your utopia. So actually, uh, Trafalgar should be reckoned as a metaphor. It is a kind of utopia fantasy, which intends to heal Billy's PTSD. On a compare and a contrast, why does Billy need to create a so-called utopia, Trafalgar, uh, because he has experienced the this utopia that is the slaughterhouse five. In short, it is the uh, second war. Okay. So here is our uh, man, Billy. Uh, actually, this novel is called Vonegor's self-autobiography. And Billy, he himself is a new identity of his, 
historical truth that is trying to employ fiction to solve the question with a sense of the complex of guilt. So, so the reason this of this identity is try to solve the uh, complex of be, feel uh, of feeling guilty during the war. And the Slaughterhouse House Five is as a fulfillment of the this utopia, a beginning also that make an the ideal of American dream. And when the American dream fulfilled, Billy himself he he, he can create an utopia fantasy that is traveled more. Okay, so actually E.T. is an observation of extra extraterrestrial intelligence, which symbolizes a civilized new culture that cannot be observed by normal human beings, but they can observe certain targets as a guinea pig in their lab. So when Billy first encountered with the ET, he asked, where am I? And the ET began the introduction. Trapping another blob of amber, Mr. Pilgrim, we are where we have to be just now. And Billy, he said, how, how did I get there? You sound to me as you don't believe in free, free will, said Billy Pilgrim. So apparent, apparently the Trafalgar Moore ET represent for the returning of the military force that cannot realize free will and the reason, but only to the compulsory facts. So it represents for the fact that without any reason or with any room for the existence of the free will. In other words, the it in the slogan, so it goes, represent for the compulsory and the doomed facts through all the timeline in human's life. So, uh, in my viewpoints, the the ET is very similar. It's very similar to a metaphor of artificial intelligence. It it can learning. It has so called learning process and so called the ability of searching information without any emotional reaction. ET could be explored as a similarly non human brain confirmation to employ the scientific and the military process to capture and explore the human intelligence from Billy Pilgrim. Certainly, Billy didn't get the real mental relief from his fantasy. He is still searching for something that can explain why am I alive in Slaughterhouse Five. So what does Kurt Nagel intend to redefine his self pre presence in this novel. According to Jin Shi, he said that Bonego paradise Jesus Christ too, as Jesus was mocked by soldiers and passerby. Billy was left at by his comrades in arms during the war. Another important point was that Billy bore a striking resemblance to Jesus' death. So Vonego, he invents Billy to become a super ego and an ego that is similar to Jesus Christ's position of his lifetime and resurrection. However, Billy, he himself doubts about the super ego parts of the Jesus Christ as the son of the almighty God in this novel. So the ET, they are more like the combination of the curious non-believers of seeking for the secret of man's life. Bonego may want to create Billy Pilgrim as a weary and weak part of the Middle Age Jesus Christ fantasy. And Jesus Christ, he, he compared the church as his bride. Thus, in this novel, in Trafalgar Moore, Billy, he needs to make love with a superstar, Motena, in front of the peeping eyes of E.T. So on 208 of this novel, I quote, they are playing with the clocks again, said Motena, rising, preparing to put the baby into its crib. She meant their keepers, they were making the electronic clocks in the Dumo go fast, then slow, and fast again, and watching the little earthing family through peeping holes. Uh, 
So what is mesianic tone? According to my thesis, the it mainly means a tone that can reveal the e essence of completing the self-searching telos of the author. Similarly, the reader, including the self-projection protagonist in this novel, Billy, to fulfill their search of being an entity in a virtual reality. So the clocks actually represent different tone lines in two different individuals. In other words, there's only one goal to use different tone lines to focus on Billy and his partner is to examine whether the different tone lines will generate the same outcome or not. So there can be a parallel. Billy's ET experiences can be reckoned as a parody of Jesus Christ's resurrection and an unfulfilled part of the New Testament. Therefore, Billy's peeping show can be reckoned as a waiting for the unfulfilled parts of the revelation. Billy, he invents the ET fantasy is due to the reason that he wants to create a messianic time space that he can redeem him to get rid of the historical clocks. So he has to invent this fantasy, right? Billy need to make love with the superstar due to the reason of the collective anxiety and to have the expectation of the new baby for this new family can give birth to stop all the walking clocks. And, and maybe th this time the messianic time come, they can redeem all the suffering living and the dead people. So he has to invent the fantasy by the ETP being locked to illustrate the historical timelines and employs the fantasy to bring all the different absence and presence into oneness of life form so that everything can restart and has its meaning for why those happen rather than the slogan, so it goes. So in English, there is some poor tea wheat of the birds. It is the poor tear wheat. Actually, it is poor people waiting tea with tears is still waiting and the birds singing simultaneously mourn for the death and that cannot speak to the redeemed themselves. So actually, according to Foucault, madness is the lower limits of human's truth. And here in this novel, the war become a tool and a compulsory force to its soldier to examine the lower limits of human truth. And I, I give a graph, uh, a dream insight, and I just go on to the conclusion parts. So Billy Pilgrim is actually a poor man crying inside of his madness fantasy that is waiting for a genuine interpretation for all the seemingly meaningless waste of lives. And first the dream comes to Billy. Why he dreamed to be in the, is to, is he, the dream is let him become as an Eden and Billy himself is become the only other. And why he wants to be the giraffe is because the giraffe only needs approximately two hours and 20 minutes of sleep. Very similar as the uh, limited sleep of the soldier in the, in the battle. So Billy find himself is being treated as an animal in, in the, during the war. So actually this animal figure that Billy finally become a giraffe is a kind of sign of anti-war. In addition, the reason the two females surround Billy, surround Billy signifies that Billy actually lacked the image of mother and wife in his heart. And he, and actually the color of the graph signifies represent the sign of the food, the need of food and the homemade safety. Okay. And thank you. And this is my word site hits. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Angie. Um, would you be able to uh, stop sharing your screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so uh, next we have Zach. Zach, if you want to give a little bio about yourself or just get started, however you'd like to proceed. Okay, sure. Hey, everybody. My name is Zach Laminer. Um, I'm an assistant professor at UNC uh, Pembroke um, in North Carolina, um, and I teach uh, 20th century American literature and Native American literature primarily. Um, and I'm coming to you live from my home today. Um, so here we are. Uh, okay, um, my talk is called Forgetting Red Power, Slaughterhouse Five, Indigenous Protest, and Vonnegut's Critique of Settler Colonialism. Um, in this talk, I hope to show how we might see the influence of indigenous protest during what Daniel Cobb has called the long 1960s on Slaughterhouse Five. Against the tendency to remember the 60s through what Eileen Morton Robinson calls the black white binary, how could remembering red power help us come to see Slaughterhouse Five as offering a critique of settler colonialism? Uh, this idea began as a hunch based on a set of coincidences I noticed when I wrote my dissertation. Uh, Slaughterhouse Five hit books were shelves in March of 1969. In November of 1969, the direct action uh, organization Indians of All Tribes occupied Alcatraz Island for what would stretch out to 19 months. The form of indigenous organizing that would be named Red Power, though, had been in process for a little more than 20 years by the time of that occupation. Some of the movement's most influential strategizing had taken shape in the 1950s and early 60s on the campus of the University of Chicago, where Vonnegut had been a student in the late 40s. And while Vonnegut wouldn't have been there for the strategy sessions, I couldn't ignore the potential for the movement's influence given Vonnegut's concept for his thesis, a study of how the ghost dance religion of the 1890s aided in revolutionary organizing against settlers, which Vonnegut hoped to use as a model for understanding, quote, what it took to form a revolutionary community. Uh, although his committee ultimately rejected the proposal for being, quote, too radical, Jerome Klinkowitz notes that the revolutionary consciousness and an interest in organizing uh, the organization of human communities would persist throughout his novels to follow. As Vonnegut wrote those novels, uh, news reports of Red Power protest action and of policy advocacy began to come in a steady stream. As Darcy McNichol, a member of the Flathead and Kootenai Nations, veteran activist, writer, and professor, reported in The Nation in 1966. McNichol, along with anthropology professor Sol Tax at the University of Chicago, had worked to organize the first Chicago conference in 1961, where participants drafted the Declaration of Indian Purpose in hopes of shifting policy talks then underway in Washington toward needs defined by Native peoples, not non-Native policy advisors. As McNichol reports in the Nation article, self-determination for Native peoples was a crucial and broadly encompassing goal for the movement in the mid-1960s, focused on land, resources, education, rights of access, infrastructure improvements, economic opportunity, and political and cultural autonomy. As is the case today, advocacy and action focused on challenging the governance structures and logics of settler colonialism a term that names the political organization of a state established through the elimination and possession of indigenous populations in the same land base. The US is a settler colony and US policy has stemmed from a logic of elimination and possessive entitlement to space since its earliest eras. While Slaughterhouse-Five does not engage with the policy elements of red power, it does I argue bear the influence of indigenous critiques of settler logics, particularly on the powerful ways in which everyday settler life both generates and sustains the bureaucratic blindness that McNichol and others fought to correct. For a period description of everyday settler experience from a native perspective, I wanna to turn to an indigenous university student McNichol quotes in his 66 essay from the nation. Quote, what frightens me most about white society is the terrible loneliness. What you would call friendships are usually what we would call exclusive alliances of two or three or half a dozen against the world. Tribal people have an inclusive social sensibility which no white person ever experiences. It is funny to hear the isolated white man advocating for integration for Indians. To us, he seems to be saying, come, join us and be lonely. Why is it that any cultural difference, not only Indian, but anywhere in the world, is an aggravation to white people? The student's analysis points to the core logics of Euro-American settlement, self-possessive individualism, private property ownership, which are fundamentally exclusive and fearful of difference. We can see the influence of indigenous critiques of settler whiteness, I would argue, through Vonnegut's characterization of Billy Pilgrim. Consider the series of otherwise mundane details about Billy that seem to stack up from this perspective. Valencia's fantasy of becoming Queen Elizabeth and Billy's being Christopher Columbus during their Indian summer honeymoon in New England, or their discussions of colonial moonlight silver patterns. Billy's Lion Club's Lions Club luncheon with a Marine major who voices Curtis LeMay's answer to Vietnam to bomb them into the Stone Age, an idea Billy takes with his characteristic, so it goes. The bumper stickers on his car, impeach Earl Warren and support your local police, which speak to an alignment with right-wing politics and an unexamined, so-it-goes sort of commitment to white supremacy. 
LeMay, it's worth noting, was Alabama Governor George Wallace's running mate on the third party ticket in 1968. That Billy's wealthy father-in-law, a member of the John Birch Society, led him down this political path is likewise worth noting because it again points to his quiet acceptance of circumstance. Considering these details from the perspective of everyday settler experience, it seems that what we see of Billy in 68 is Vonnegut's caricature of an everyday middle-class right of center whiteness, insulated, isolated, alone, adjacent to, but not vocal about racism and violence, silent in a way that would become politically expedient for Richard Nixon and his now infamous coinage of the silent majority in November of 1969. Billy's quietism is thus an entry point into Vonnegut's critical framing of the relationship between silence, everyday life and settler violence. Those accustomed to silence become ever more inured to violence around them. This numbness and detachment from otherwise present and urgent demands for change and the persistently pessimistic belief that change is impossible are outgrowths of this kind of quietist philosophy. A feeling that the moment is structured that way, which Billy learns on Shalfamador, serves the interest of historical memorialization of past atrocity and the ways in which discourses of national memory can encase atrocity in the quote, amber of the moment. Calling back to Vonnegut's proposed thesis at Chicago, what would it take to change these attitudes? The novel's emphasis on optometrics and ways of seeing suggests a potential alternative. Consider the line frames are where the money is in light of protests against bureaucratic blindness, whether in Vietnam policy or federal Indian policy at home. Vonnegut's Trelfamadorian description of earthling vision provides a useful metaphor here, describing Billy's head encased in a steel sphere with only one eye hole, which looked through six feet of pipe so that Whatever Billy saw through the pipe, he had no choice but to say to himself, that's life. Billy's isolation from the fullness of reality he cannot perceive suggests the influence of ideological lenses and frames on our experiences, such that what feels like life can be, from another perspective, impossibly narrow. Consider the novel's play with temporality as having also been influenced by indigenous critiques of settler time. Billy's passive acceptance of fate suggests an outlook on a world that understands the present to reflect all time, a lesson he also learns in Shelf Amador. Red power activism's engagements with temporalities, a justified successive treaty abrogation, termination policy, and federal recognition status critique similar forms of presentism. And in Slaughterhouse Five, the voice of settler chronopolitics is Bertrand Copeland Rumford, official Air Force historian whose narrative of the Dresden firebombing provides a backward justification of the unspeakable violence Billy experienced. When Billy tries to speak up, he finds himself, quote, trying to prove to a willfully deaf and blind enemy that he was interesting to hear and see. The, quote, mixed feelings Billy must have had are the only way this official perspective can accommodate the historical rupture his presence signifies. Red power resistance to Eurocentric anthropology as a tool of erasure and settler self-justification seems to have influenced Slaughterhouse-Five most of all. Through its imagination of Tralfamador, Slaughterhouse-Five turns the science fiction convention of the stranger in an alien land on its head. This time, the pilgrim is the subject of the anthropological inquisition, and the Tralfamadorians take much delight in Billy's life ways and quaint customs. Because the Tralfamadorians already know all time, though, their inquiries are solely for their own entertainment, and Billy becomes the butt of the joke, believing, as he does, that what he learns there, that nothing will make a difference, will paradoxically make a difference at home. Deferring the target of his critique through staging it as an alien civilization's delight in human strangeness, Vonnegut offers readers the opportunity to explore their own imbrication and the machinations that feel like fate, but that aren't in fact faded. Moments appear structured, Slaughterhouse-Five tells us, according to the frames through which we see them. If we reframe our understanding of Slaughterhouse-Five and its relationship to indigenous protests, then we can begin to see invitations to decolonial thinking emerge from the novel's satirical address of Vietnam era politics and policies and the rhetorical gestures of the great society. And if we read Billy against himself, we can see an invitation toward utopian thinking around what it might take to organize a revolutionary community of people like him, worn down by violence, inclined towards silence, and encouraged to invest in themselves and leave the rest to fate. Thank you. I love the very performative nature of clapping on Zoom. Um, but <laughs> thank you very much, Zach. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, we have a lot of interesting overlap already, so um, I'm, I'm excited to, to see where we you know, end up after, after all these talks here. Um, next is Selena. Is that right, Selena? Uh, Selena. Selena, gotcha. Um, Okay, Selena. 
Hello, um, my name is Selena Orion. I am in Flagstaff, Arizona. I am a graduate student at Northern Arizona University. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, my paper is called Rumifer's Revenge. Um, Winston Niles Rumifer's from the Sirens of Titan was not wholly under the Tromalfador's control as he claims to be at the end of the novel. The Cronuson classic Infobitalum, where his abilities to manifest across the solar system, was given to him so that a special piece could be delivered to Salo on Titan. There was no specification on how the part gets to Titan, so long as it arrives. Murphy takes advantage of this situation to enact revenge against his wife Beatrice and Malachi Constant by orchestrating a series of unfortunate events to torment and humiliate them. The first chapter begins with Malachi Constant venturing to Rumiford's uh, home upon his request so they could meet. Murphy at this point only appears on Earth through materialization, which occurs every 59 days. The materialization is private from the public and public for nine years and only a secret few have witnessed the event. The reason that Rumiford keeps appearing in the manor is the Cronus's classic Invitalum. This is a source of Rumiford's power. It allows him to materialize on Earth, Mars, Mercury, and Titan. The novel also alludes to the fact that Rumiford can see the future or at least has prior knowledge of it. He explains, when I ran my spaceship into the Kronos and Classic Infidelum, it came to me in a flash that everything that ever has been always will be, and everything that ever will be ha always has been. This provides reasonable context as to how he knows what is going to happen before the event occurs, but it does not fully address why he is maturing across the solar system. In Francis C. Altamir's uh, The Fourth Dissertation, he states that Rumiford is not confined to a single continuum. Each instance of his materialization is based on a timely interval that locks Rumiford in a loop that cycles him around the solar system. However, the future is not permanently fixed and is constantly changing based on the choices and actions of others, which is proves the theory of Rumiford possessing foresight. In Philip M. Ruman's essay, he reasonably explains, what Vonnegut creates in essence is the acceptance of Henry Bergenson's world where not only is man free to move at random through time, but also able to experience a progressive interiorization into memory where Bergeson sees time residing. With this perspective in mind, it can be relatively inferred that Rumiford is existing in multiple places at once with a shared collective knowledge that allows him to adjust his plan based on the information presented to him. Even though he is trapped in the Kronos and Classic Infobitalum's orbit, he uses this predicament to control events around him and manipulate fate in his favor. Malachi Constant does not share much in common, sorry, Malachi and Beatrice do not share much in common at first, but they are both very stubborn individuals and they will not let their future be controlled by fate. Rumiford expects this to occur and plays to their predictable nature in favor of his desired outcome. Initially, it seems as though Rumiford is trying to tempt Malachi into wanting to go on the journey around the solar system when the photo of the three sirens uh, appear, uh, the science is exchanged. Vonnegut addresses early on in the novel that Malachi is a playboy. The text describes that the first instance where Malachi sees the sirens, Constance sank into a wing chair again. He had to look away from all that beauty in order to keep from bursting into tears. While Malachi manages to resist the temptation of the sirens, he still goes out of his way to avoid space by, spelling, by selling the spaceship owned by one of his companies. He also uses the photos to advertise for Moon Mist cigarettes, which at least partially contributes to his financial ruin in a myriad of oncoming lawsuits. Where nothing left for him on Earth, with nothing left for him on Earth, a in potential prison time on the horizon, he has no other choice but to accept the Martians' offer to join the Army of Mars, therefore following the path that he strove to avoid all along. Beatrice's manipulations is a little more complex. Once she first hears of her fate with Malachi, she goes out of her way to avoid her husband's materializations until she believes she can outsmart him. She hypothetically asks how Malachi and her fate comes about, which Rumford shares after he, she prods him for it. While most of what he tells her is a lie, the text reveals this much of Rumford's story was true. The whale was going to be renamed and fired on Tuesday, and the President of the United States was announcing a new age of space. Rumiford purposely leaks the name, knowing that she was going to buy the same spaceship company that Malachi sells, in hopes of having a say in her future. This action almost leads to her financial ruin, but she resourcefully navigates her way out of becoming homeless at the expense of Rumiford. He previously expressed a desire to keep his materializations private, but to avoid complete poverty, she allows visitors to witness the event. Unfortunately, this leads to her admitting two Martians into her home, which ends with her being abducted and taking to Mars against her will. It also enables Rumiford to capitalize on his materializations and gain influence with the rest of humanity. He uses his newfound social influence to tell his prophecies with the Martian war in order to gain a following. 
He uses this to set up the beginning of a new religion that will unite the world and will allow him to reach his purpose. It has the added benefit of achieving revenge. Rumiford's motivations for tormenting Beatrice are easy to discern from the text, as there is plenty of evidence to highlight their tense relationship. From the very beginning of the novel, they are at odds with one another despite being married. Beatrice exhibits care for Rumiford in the presence of others, but reverts to a colder disposition once they are alone. While this is not an oddity in the literary world, their relationship is anything but typical. In chapter six of the text, he tells the story of Beatrice and Malachi's journey to Mars. Rumiford mentions that Beatrice will be held captive in a, and sedated in a stateroom. With the exception of this specific room, Malachi was free to move about the ship, though he was forewarned against going into that room because it was supposedly contained the most beautiful woman to ever visit Mars. The crew then proceeds to get drunk where someone slips the key uh, to this room to Malachi, who went inside and then proceeded to rape her. This terrible event led to the conception of their son, Chrono, who coincidentally finds the piece that Sailor needs to return home. At the end of the chapter, Rumerford reveals, but who, but when the shot, hotshot Lieutenant Colonel got to her there in the spaceship bound for Mars, she was still a virgin. This information reveals that Rumerford and Beatrice never consummated their marriage, which she claims is a pretty good joke on her husband. This is not the last of her humiliation. After they arrive on Mars, Beatrice describes that Rumerford snatched us out of our lives, said B. He put us to sleep. He cleaned out our minds the way you clean the seeds out of a jack-o'-lantern. He wired us like robots trained us, aimed us, burned us out in a good cause. In addition, when Beatrice and her son return to Earth, she loses her front teeth that Rumerford has replaced, insisting that they be made of gold. He then gives her a job selling baubles outside of her old mansion and wipes her from Earth's records so that no one could figure out who she was at the end of the war. Rumerford orchestrated this entire situation, possibly because he wanted to punish her for never consummating their marriage and giving him children. He keeps her in the dark long enough to slut shame her in front of the world and exile her to Titan. Rumerford's hatred toward Malachi involves some creative deducing, but the evidence is there. After setting the text, it is reasonable to assume that Rumerford holds Malachi possibly accountable for his inability to have children. In the beginning of chapter one, Malachi demonstrates a need to prove his superior over others, and he immediately reverts to this mindset upon meeting Rumerford for the very first time. Perhaps in a bid to make Malachi feel at ease, Rumerford announces that he cannot reproduce, which seems to be a peculiar bit of information included in the text. It's even more unusual that Vonnegut never mentions this again. However, there are context clues scattered throughout this novel that could support this theory. After their meeting, Malachi uses his pictures of the sirens to advertise for moon mist cigarettes. This company is the beginning, of, beginning downfall of Malachi's fortune because people who smoke moon mist cigarettes couldn't have children, even if they wanted them. The cigarettes continue to come up through the novel, which stresses the importance of it in the story. While this information seems to be a bit of a stretch, it is also very plausible given that Rumerford is often seen smoking over the course of the story. This timeline is confusing, so Rumerford could have accidentally smoked a moon mist cigarette over the course of his materializations across the solar system. In retribution, Rumerford goes to extraordinary lengths to keep Malachi apart from Beatrice and his son, even going as far to send him to Mercury for several years before thrusting them back together once more. Unfortunately, the reunion, the reunion is the final act of Rumiford's revenge, as he not only demonizes Malachi's character, but also humiliates him as well. Like with Beatrice, Rumiford had stolen Malachi's identity and only reveals it to him at the most convenient time. Rumiford uses Malachi as an example of what not to be in this new world before exiling him to Titan, where Silas' part is finally delivered. Kurt Vonnegut's The Siren Titan is a complex story with moral dilemmas, religious undertones, chaotic order, finding one purpose, the concept of free will, strained time loops, and it is even a tale of revenge. Rumerford uses the Kronosin classic Ifibitalum to gain power and to torment Malachi and Beatrice. Even though Rumerford claims to be controlled by the Tremalfador, he still exerts a modicum of free will over the course of the story that enables him to do what he wants. He develops an elaborate scheme as a means to incite intergalactic war, make contact with an alien species, and create a new religion from scratch to unite mankind just so he can have a part delivered to an alien robot, on, or alien robot living on Titan. All of that effort seems to be wasted if it were just for a simple piece. It would be simpler for rumor to have his Martian scour the planet for it and then personally deliver to Sela once it was found. He expresses that his intentions were to make life better for the human race, but he still led a mass extermination of captive humans who were brainwashed and tortured into attacking their own people. The whole point of the war was just to bring them together in a united front, 
While the intent was to benefit the masses, it still led to the suffering of thousands of people and his motivations for helping others is therefore corrupted by his own agenda. <sighs> Maybe, maybe a little bit of audible clapping. Yeah, all right. Um, <laughs> thank you, Selena. <laughs> okay, we are more than halfway through and then we can get down to some discussion. Uh, so next up is Brian. Hi, can everybody hear me? Cool. I've had a tremendous amount of difficulties technologically. Uh, in any case, so my name is Brian. I'm a high school English teacher uh, from North Bergen, New Jersey. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about pairing uh, Night, which is a Holocaust memoir by Elie Wiesel, uh, with Slaughterhouse Five. Now, I do have a, a handout that I'm going to send a link to in the chat if anyone wants to look at it. Cool. So uh, the idea for this really came from a, a much longer project, uh, which is really about how we teach war literature in public high school. Um, so the question really is, well, how is World War II represented? Uh, and pretty much unanimously across curricula around the United States, it's either by Knight or Slaughterhouse-Five. Um, the problem is that the way that these two texts are taught tend to sort of dehistoricize them, remove them from their context. The way that Knight is typically taught in high school uh, kind of reifies the Holocaust and makes it a, a thing rather than an event. Um, it focuses on memoir elements uh, and really what I consider to be false empathetic connection. Uh, if you want an example of what that is, uh, go ahead and just Google the cattle car activity or uh, Anne Frank quiet time activity. They are pretty, pretty horrific. Uh, on the other hand, we have Slaughterhouse-Five, which in the high school classroom boils down to a postmodern element scavenger hunt. You know, find uh, postmodern schizophrenia, pastiche, parody, solipsism, and then that's it, that's the end. Uh, there's really no mention of Dresden or Hamburg or really any part of World War II at all. So it's, it's my contention that by pairing a Holocaust memoir with uh, Slaughterhouse-Five, we can more holistically teach World War II sort of as an event. Uh, now, this, of course, is not meant to you know, replace education about the Holocaust or World War II, uh, but to make it significantly more connected uh, in public schools. So the question of, you know, why teach these two texts, uh, there are some obviously some explicit connections. Uh, they both take place during World War II. Uh, they both, of course, a, describe the trials of types of prisoners of war, uh, and they're both widely taught in public schools around the country. Uh, more interestingly, however, uh, both books were published in the 1960s. Uh, Slaughterhouse-Five, of course, 1969, and uh, Bizell's English translation of Night is in 1960. And this, of course, represents really a beginning of a reckoning uh, with America's vision of itself. This is, of course, the beginning of the counterculture movement, civil rights, anti-Vietnam sentiment, and so on and so forth. Uh, really, it's the sense that the, the good war of World War II might not have been so good after all. Uh, of course, the books also make pretty clear references to the events in one another. Uh, within Night, there are references to both the Eastern and Western Front during World War II, uh, various other uh, prisoners of war that Ellie runs into uh, through his time in the concentration camps. And at the very end, he is rescued by American forces at Buchenwald. Now, Slaughterhouse-Five, of course, references the Holocaust in kind of two main sections. Uh, in the introductory chapter of the cocktail party, uh, but more interestingly, in the POW camp towards uh, sort of middle end of the book, uh, to quote, only the candles and soap were made of, uh, were of German origin. They had a ghostly opalescent similarity. And the British had no way of knowing it, but the candles and the soap were made from the fat rendered Jews and gypsies and fairies and communists and other enemies of the state. So it goes. So, you know, we have these very explicit connections between the two texts, uh, but more importantly for us, we have a couple implicit connections. Um, for me, the most interesting one is that both of these texts deal with the limits of language in the face of atrocity. You know, at a, at a certain point of horror and barbarism, human language can only go so far, right? So 
how can we possibly describe it? Now, in his new introduction to the translation of 2006, uh, Wiesel admits pretty much exactly that, quote, uh, while I had many things to say, I did not have the words to say them. Painfully aware of my limitations, I watched helplessly as language became an obstacle. Uh, this sort of similar, similarly uh, mirrors Adorno's statement in Cultural Criticism and Society, uh, to write poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric. And this corrodes even the knowledge of why it has become impossible to write poetry today. Uh, it's a sense that there is no signifier, no signified, no word that can possibly come close to actually describing the events uh, that Holocaust survivors, you know, experience. Now, Slaughterhouse-Five, of course, also admits the limits to language uh, in the introductory chapter as well. Uh, Vonnegut says, but not many words about Dresden came from my mind then, not enough of them to make a book anyway. Uh, he really can't describe Dresden. Uh, at the, uh, the timeline of all of uh, the characters in the book, Dresden is just orange cross hatching. And he never describes the event itself. He describes the prologue and the aftermath which he describes uh, using comparisons to the moon, you know, something so impossibly foreign and difficult to describe that it really does hammer home this idea of uh, language as a barrier. Now, despite this, both uh, Wiesel and Vonnegut both deal with the concept of witnessing, uh, that despite the limits of language, um, it is crucial to witness these events and, and tell them to other people later. We, of course, have Vonnegut writing his uh, book about Dresden in the beginning. We have, at the beginning of night, Moshe the Beetle, uh, and, of course, Elie Wiesel you know, as, a, as a human being. Now, both texts use very clipped, fragmentary passages and, and irony, uh, which you can consider, of course, to be postmodern schizophrenia, uh, and can be viewed from a perspective of uh, PTSD and trauma studies, which, um, in my experience, students tend to really gravitate towards something, at least in the high school, uh, it's, it's easier for them to sort of conceptualize. And so we can begin by asking, how do Wiesel, Vonnegut, and Billy Pilgrim cope with the horrors that they have seen? Uh, then we can begin answering this uh, with the idea of self as character. Uh, Vonnegut, of course, uses metafiction to place himself in the story. Uh, Ellie refers to himself in the book as Eliezer rather, rather than Ellie, uses two separate names. Uh, Billy, of course, loses agency, and he is forced to perform uh, at different points in time. Uh, and again, this is kind of based on you guys being aware of, of Knight, but there are a tremendous amount of times in Knight where Ellie refers to himself and his body as two separate entities. So it's, of course, sort of the, the splitting of self. So uh, I do believe that pairing these texts will sort of allow us to examine the impact of the really horrifically destructive events in World War II. Uh, the Holocaust, Dresden, Hamburg, uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, um, just to scratch the surface. Uh, and to examine them in a more holistic fashion than perhaps public schools have been doing uh, to this point. Uh, now, if you are looking at the Handout, there are questions that I'm gonna leave you guys with, but of course I'll, I'll leave those for later during the discussion, but uh, I'm interested in what everyone has to say about this. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Brian. Um, would you actually, could you share the handout again? My Zoom likes to kick me out. Um, and, and did so before I was able to, to see it. Beauty, thank you. Okay, I will, I will get that up before I get kicked out and brought back in. I don't know what's wrong with my computer, but it was real magical teaching online during the spring, as you can imagine. Um, okay, and uh, I am not going to be giving my talk, which actually is kind of, uh, fortuitous because it seems like I would have been kind of at a left field uh, with the, at least with the connections I'm starting to see. So anyway, enough from me. Uh, Susan, last but certainly not least. Uh, thanks, Nicole. Um, I'm Susan Farrell. I'm a professor of English at the College of Charleston. 
um, very fascinating to hear works. And I think you'll see some, some real connections in my work, especially with, um, I think what Sap was talking about. So um, I'm actually gonna share my screen. Um, this paper is, or this talk here is part of a longer project I'm working on that has to do with uh, Vonnegut, the historiography of Dresden, David Irving, et cetera. So just that is a little background. So I apologize in advance, my talk is 10 minutes long. So um, at one point Tom said, maybe we could have 10 minutes. So I took him up on it. Uh, but anyway, let me share my screen and see if you guys can see this. All right, so um, can you all see my screen? Yeah, okay, great. So it's well known that the numbers Kurt Vonnegut used to describe the Allied firebombing of Dresden and Slaughterhouse-Five were inaccurate. The novel says that 135,000 people were killed in the bombing and that the massacre had been, quote, much worse than Hiroshima, in which approximately 71,000 people were killed. As most of you probably know, the mistaken numbers come from Vonnegut's reliance on the work of popular British historian David Irving, who made the claims in his best-selling 1963 book, The Destruction of Dresden. Um, and some of you might remember that uh, Colonel Rumford, who Billy shares a hospital room with at one point in the book, actually asks his fifth wife, Lily, to get a copy of The Destruction of Dresden. Um, Irving was later accused of being a Holocaust denier and imprisoned in Austria in 2006. So this talk explores David Irving's downward spiral his journey from respected historian to imprisoned neo-Nazi sympathizer. While previously Irving had been praised by some eminent historians for his energetic work in archives tracking down Third Reich documents and for interviewing aging Nazis, his reputation began to suffer with the sympathetic portrait of Hitler he painted in one of his best known books, 1977's Hitler's War. In this work, Irving argued that Hitler didn't know about the final solution and that the Fuhrer actually worked to curb the overly zealous killing of Jews suggested by his underlings. In the late 1980s and 90s, Irving argued that gas chambers were never used in Auschwitz. He began to drift further into outright Holocaust denial, arguing that most Jews died of disease and hunger rather than being murdered by Nazis and that the real crime of the war was civilian deaths on all sides, not the attempted genocide of the Jews. During this period, Irving also began to address various neo-Nazi groups in Europe and the US. Um, Irving attracted a great deal of press when in 1996, he brought a libel suit against American historian Deborah Lipstadt, who had claimed in her 1993 book, Denying the Holocaust, that Irving was not only a denier, but that he was an anti-Semite who distorted historical documents. The case is dramatized in the 2016 Hollywood movie, Denial. Even though Irving had brought the case, British libel laws put the burden of proof on the defendant rather than the accuser. So Lipstadt's lawyers had to prove that her defamations were true. Press coverage sometimes suggested that Irving was the one being prosecuted rather than the other way around. Even more, it came to seem as if the Holocaust itself were on trial. Um, but what's most interesting for our purposes here is Irving's early work on the Dresden bombing, a topic the film doesn't address. Even though many historians believed Irving's mistakes only had to do with Hitler's knowledge of the final solution and that the rest of his research was sound, this wasn't the case. According to Cambridge historian Richard Evans, who spent two years researching all of Irving's work for the trial, the destruction of Dresden was deeply flawed from the beginning. Irving's publisher, in fact, had written to him in 1963 that his book was riddled with historical inaccuracies and could be taken as a work of Nazi propaganda. The publisher made many changes in the draft, writing to Irving later in 1963 that the book had been, quote, cleared of its somewhat evil undercurrents. So how did Irving's estimates of Dresden deaths come about? Surprisingly, immediately after the bombing, estimates by German officials put the number of dead between 25,000 and 40,000. But Irving relied partly on higher estimates of nearly 135,000 supplied to him by Hans Voigt, 
who was a fascist schoolmaster and local Dresden official. Irving later revised his figures upward to as many as 250,000 based on a mysterious document called TB 47. But the same TB 47 document had been dismissed as a forgery in 1955 by another historian, an assessment Irving himself had agreed with at the time, branding the document in 1963 as, quote, a piece of propaganda and a cunning forgery. Later, Irving would claim to have seen only a few sentences of this document in 1963, and that he changed his mind when he saw the full thing. But the full document Irving actually saw was a copy of a copy of a copy of an extract. It included no authenticating marks such as signatures, seals, etc. Further, Irving claimed that the actual author of the document was a Dr. Max Funfack, chief medical examiner of Dresden. In 1965, Dr. Funfack wrote to Irving saying he was not a chief medical examiner as Irving claimed but only a hospital urologist, and that he had no knowledge of the actual numbers of the dead. He insisted as well that he was not the author of the document. But Irving clung to his previous claims about the document's reliability and authorship. Interestingly, the real document TB 47 was found in 1965, signed by the Dresden police chief, which put the numbers at 25,000 expected killed. It turns out that the Nazi propaganda ministry had simply added a zero to the number in March of 1945. Irving was sent a copy of this new document and subsequently published a letter in the Times of London on July 7, 1966, retreating from his period, previous estimates and accepting the new numbers. Still, he continued to emphasize the false document in later editions of his book and retained his original estimates of the dead. Tellingly, in 1985, Irving's German publishers added the words, a novel, to the title page of his book. By the 90s, Irving was claiming that only 25,000 Jews had been murdered over four years in Auschwitz. The rest had died of disease. Historian Richard Evans believes Irving was seeking to draw parallels between Nazi war crimes and the newly accepted numbers of victims of the Allied bombing. Today, there's pretty widespread agreement about the Dresden numbers. A, de a definitive new report released in 2010, based on five years of research in the city's archives, confirms a death toll of no more than 25,000 people. Many books about the Irving trial, often by key participants, were published afterward and raised some interesting moral and philosophical questions. Does the Holocaust have a special status in the catalog of human cruelty? Or is that view a distortion of the historical record? Was the Allied bombing of Dresden militarily justified or not? Would trials such as this limit free speech and have the chilling effect of policing public discussion? But perhaps most significantly for literary studies in general and for Vonnegut studies in particular, which have long debated Vonnegut's status in relation to postmodernism, the trial also brought up issues of of whether objective truth is possible in the postmodern age or whether relativism must reign. Some intellectually conservative historians, including Evans, David Cesarini, Jeffrey Wheatcroft, and others, saw the trial as a triumph against postmodern relativism, a confirmation that facts and truth matter. Um, it's interesting to note that the film was of denial was published in 2016, right at the beginning of the Trump administration. People with interest in these questions was running really high. Yet others such as journalist Didi Gutenplan critiqued such historians for the crude suggestion of a link between Holocaust denial and an intellectual climate in which scholars have questioned whether texts have any fixed meaning. Such historians show an incomplete and unnuanced understanding of postmodernism, according to Gutenplan. So just how responsible is Vonnegut for perhaps spreading misinformation about Dresden in the novel? Some thinkers certainly believe he bears blame. In a 2010 New Yorker article, George Packer writes that Vonnegut, quote, made Dresden's name a byword for nihilistic destruction. For many readers of Irving and Vonnegut, the bombing of Dresden scrambled the order of perpetrators and victims in the Second World War 
and came close to establishing a moral equivalence. Deborah Lipstadt herself, in a post on her blog appearing in April of 2007, wrote, people like Irving like to inflate the number of dead in Dresden as a means of engaging in immoral equivalencies. Vonnegut helped perpetuate that myth and spread this form of denial. He probably did so initially unwittingly, but since the publication of that book, enough has been written to show that this is not true and he could have corrected it had he been so inclined. Yet it's important to remember that Irving's book was popular, a bestseller, and not yet publicly challenged when Vonnegut finished Slaughterhouse-Five. In Vonnegut's defense, the number 135,000 comes not only from Irving himself, but is quoted in both introductions to the destruction of Dresden written by military historians who disagreed about whether the bombing was justified. Neither questions Irving's numbers. Even more as late as February 20th, 1985, a New York editorial still used the number of 135,000 dead. So even the esteemed New York Times was still confused about the Dresden dead 16 years after the publication of Slaughterhouse Five. Um, so like Zach, I'll leave you with just a couple of questions. Um, first of all, should Vonnegut have updated the numbers in later editions of the novel as Lipstadt argues? Um, by the mid nineties, for instance, when the 25th anniversary edition was published, I, I would think that Vonnegut almost certainly had to know about the debates over Irving's numbers. Um, finally, is the difference between history and novel, as Anne Rigney argues, enough to excuse uh, the factual inaccuracies? Or do even novels have certain obligations to historical accuracy? So that's the end. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Susan. And sorry, I turned off my camera. I, my internet connection is unstable, and sometimes that helps with the situation. So we'll we'll see. If I if I leave, it's not because I don't love you. I will probably be back in a few seconds. Um, okay. So um, yeah, it, it seems like we have a lot of um, interesting overlap, sort of conversations happening that. Certainly, I imagine we're not intentional, um, but nonetheless, there. So, um, does anybody does anybody have any anything they'd like to begin with? Um, okay. Well, I think Tom has his hand up. You do. I was using the raise hand feature. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. I can't. I'm ever, I can't see that. Yeah. May I ask where that is? No. <laughs> it's if you look in the bottom under reactions, you should have a number of faces uh, and passive aggressive notions to the speaker to go faster or slower. Um, and then the raise hand feature there. But it's true. It doesn't show up anywhere unless you happen to have that person's uh, video showing at that time. So we've got just enough people. I think they're off screen. Um, I have, sir, I had promised in the email to everyone when I uh, put these things together that I would offer up the first question. So it seems only fair that I offer up the first question. And I tried to make it a synthetic one without pinpointing too much. But I admit, I am very distracted by uh, Susan's work about Holocaust denial at the end of this. So I'll begin big and see if I can toss it to Susan as a way to get um, maybe lots of people to think about this, but I'm struck by the number of ways that people have used the notion of adjacency in their work here in these papers today, that we're pushing two things together in each of these, um, these short papers that I think are really, really provocative. And so just to sort of name check things that I've, I've taken notes of, Angie's paper is, is really getting us to think about what's the adjacencies of these symbolic orders. What happens when we find these metaphors and push them together? Uh, Zach is talking about the adjacency of new source materials. What happens to an old war horse text when we go digging around on a hunch, which I love, I love a hunch. That's fantastic. Uh, Selena is telling us about, you know, what it is we're doing when we have the adjacent appearance of someone who seems to show up and then like 
run amok and then disappear for 59 years. And Brian having us to think about the notion of just pushing two texts into conversation together so that we can get something more than even the sum of their parts, that we can get to uh, something that looks like uh, the war. I am distracted by the sort of question though that Susan brings up here is Vonnegut was adjacent to these arguments about Dresden his whole life and was very well obsessed by those sorts of questions. So I wonder if there's a, a sort of alternate question that comes from the, the juxtaposition of these issues, which is um, we live in an age where many people have been concerned about the sheer number of people who have been dying from the COVID disease globally and in our own country. And I'm struck by thinking, is there really in a moral sort of vision of this, a difference between 135,000 and 25,000. Those are both very large numbers that were all actually existing people. And I think about not to diminish the truth in, of, of those two numbers being used in propagandistic ways, but do those numbers, they don't feel different to me if that makes any sense. And I, I don't know if there's a better way to describe that question, but when we argue over the numbers of dead, all I can hear is lots of people have died. And I don't know how to square that with saying, uh, you know, does Vonnegut bear any responsibility for that? Because Slaughterhouse-Five is much more than a novel about the accurate numbers of people who died in the Dresden bombing. It's an anti-war novel, full stop. So the fact that any people were killed with no purpose is certainly a morally bad thing. That's not a question necessarily, but I'm very, very curious about, you know, what happens when we poke these things together? Where is our responsibility as literary critics? And to what ends do we really need to care about the particularity of those numbers, if that uh, makes sense? Yeah, can, let's see, I can, oh, I'm unmuted. So can you guys hear me? <laughs> No, I'm That's a great point, Tom. And I thought about that myself as I'm working on this. I mean, does it really matter whether it's, you know, 25,000 or 135,000? It was horrible. Vinegate was there. He unburied corpses, as you know, as we all know. Um, I, I think um, the problem for Lipstadt and other Holocaust historians is, is sort of um, a moral equivalency um, uh, with the two actions. Uh, I think Vonnegut's book comes out of the 1960s and the counterculture and, and protest against the Vietnam War and very much in that spirit. Um, but it's interesting to read um, sort of newer histories of Dresden, um, in my view, tend to make the argument that Dresden was indeed um, a target that was militarily justified, even though Vonnegut makes the opposite argument in his book. Um, and that the inflation of the numbers tends to sort of, um, you know, like we saw in the quotes, you know, um, erase perpetrators and victims of the war in general in a way and make it all into an equivalency. Everybody was doing awful things. Um, so, it, you know, just some things to think about, but yeah, really interesting issues. I can push that question directly at other people, but that seems really aggressive, so I'm not going to. <laughs> but if anybody wants to take a take a stab at it, I'd love to hear people sort of play with, you know, we've got some time here to play around with the, the friction that comes from these juxtapositions. If anybody had more that maybe got cut uh, in the discussion that they wanted to limit here. Again, I think Megan has her hand up. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Megan. Hi, um, I'm Megan. I was really happy to hear all of your presentations. I'm happy to be here. Um, I just feel in response to Tom's question, if we do decide to dabble in the realm of authorial intent, we have to do a thorough job. <laughs> um, so as far as Vaughn gets responsibility in updating those numbers in later editions, we that would be him taking responsibility um, in that degree, but we also have to think if we're holding him accountable for giving this information, then we should be looking into what his motivations were for doing so in the first place. And I do believe it was ignorance at the start. And then later on, I mean, he is famous for saying that everything he writes is BS. You're welcome for abbreviating. No need to bleep me. Um, 
And then later on, I mean, the most important thing is just the large number of the fact that there were these dead, his hands-on experience with it. Um, he, even if the numbers were fumbled, we know that he, it was for the sake of impact, for the sake of, as we know, the anti-war agenda that his novel brings to light. And thinking that he has some moral fallacy because of that mistake and asking him to change his initial numbers, it almost feels like we're not giving him enough credit. Like if we're doing off the royal intent, we have to do it to the fullest. And I don't believe that he was wrong in that mistake and asking him to take it back is like, it almost seems like a contradiction. I mean, to, to sort of add to that, I think if anyone here is familiar with the work of Tim O'Brien, um, specifically with uh, things they carry, you know, he deals with the idea of story truth and happening truth, and that things that might not have happened are sometimes truer than the things that do. And so, you know, the Vonnegut's use of, you know, uh, as Megan and Susan both said, like, incorrect numbers that then later on, should he have retracted them? Yeah, maybe. But the sort of, to me, the point is not to, again, compare the Holocaust to Dresden, but to just sort of deal with the fact that this did happen. And it is, I think, under, like Dresden was significantly underreported for a long time. Um, so what is and isn't true, I think, uh, again, to deal with the fact of like atrocities as a whole, we might need story truth to be able to start communicating some of the horrific things that happened uh, in really any, in any war, but specifically World War II, because how can we use, I mean, especially in a, the climate today where truth may not, people don't really care about the truth. They care about the story truth, not the happening truth. So it's, it's I think it's a really complicated, complicated question, uh, Tom, uh, especially when it comes around to you know, belief. You know, I don't think people want to believe or it's not even that they don't want to, but a sense of being completely unable to to comprehend some of these numbers. Like you said before, uh, 25 versus 100, both are incom like inconceivable. As a human being, I can't even count that high. That's too many numbers for an English teacher. I can't do it. So I don't know. I mean, that's a little bit of rambling, but I think it the idea of story versus happening, I think, is incredibly important to consider in this content. Right. I, I loved what you say. I love Tim O'Brien. I teach him all the time. I've written a book about him. Um, but I have to say, you know, I, I think he's one of our greatest living writers, but honestly, story truth versus happening truth, I have to say, just it makes me squirm a little bit in the Trump era in which, you know, there's no truth. So I, yeah, I feel like if the last five years hadn't happened, then, you know, we could still be very happy about all that. But, but there is something almost, I, I feel like mm, some kind of uncomfortableness in the, in the area of, era of, you know, truthiness or, or whatever we want to call it. So, yeah, I don't know. I guess one of the things that I'm very interested in is that, and it was a short moment in your paper, Susan, that I think speaks to this, is that uh, I don't remember who, which publisher it was, but one of uh, Irving's publishers chain, adding a novel to one of his purportedly nonfiction books as if that solved all the problems. Whereas, and again, this is a genre distinction, Vonnegut was not trying to trick anyone to believe that the thing that he had said was a report on the actually existing like bombing of Dresden. It was affective and it required the manufacture of a science fiction framework for him to do it. Because we know now very well of the number of drafts where he tried to do it as realism and he said it was too preachy. And so I'm taken by this idea that a novelist is allowed a certain level of, I don't wanna say freedom, uh, but I do wanna say that like, 
the number served Vonnegut because it provided, I mean, that was the thing that he knew was wrong in the world. And so he found the number that made sense to him. And that's different than say, well, like when the uh, nonfiction and nature writer, David Quammen says, if you make up a fact in nonfiction, your book is fiction. Like it's, it just ceases to be nonfiction at that point. And Irving's crime in a literal sense is to continually not misread sources, but to manufacture things and to go back and sort of retract and change the record about this. And I, I think that, you know, this is a this is a risky move to make, but it's like we don't blame Stephen Crane if he got any of the facts about the Civil War wrong, because he didn't have all of the data available to him. And I'm interested in the ways that we as sort of you know, ultra modern scholars have access to better data than Vonnegut ever will have. We will only ever have more data than Vonnegut had. So the idea that we would somehow hold fiction writers accountable for, you know, sort of what are effectively research errors out of time, pun intended, is a, is a difficult one for me to square. And I guess if the issue is, as a result, we should not teach Slaughterhouse Five, or we should put a giant asterisk by it whenever we teach it, or something seems to sort of say like, "Hey, you're going to read this book, but it's not as important as we say it is," and that's a weird position for us to be in too. Talk about rambling. I apologize. Sorry if I may again. <laughs> um, I think also just the fact that now the number that Vonnegut presents has also taken its place in history. And just as you wouldn't go back and revise uh, racial slurs in, post in other fiction novels because of what it reflects of the period, um, granted, we all can acknowledge the fault in that. And we also don't want to go back and revise the text because it does play, especially given the Irving trials and given the debate at the time, it does serve a role now. And I wouldn't want to take that away at this point. Though there are edited versions of Huck Finn, you know, that you can you can teach in certain school districts and things. So, I mean, as these normal things go, we would like to assert our authority as literary scholars. But once they sort of enter into the the public realm of things or school boards, God forbid, you know, like those situations, then we're talking about, you know, what are what is the political machinery in which these sort of numbers dwell? I don't think anybody's taken Kurt Vonnegut to a school board because his number is wrong. <laughs> they have other sorts of problems with that. But I don't know. I, I don't want to talk too much. I'm talking too much. And I really want to know if Zach has more hunches, sort of because I want to steal them. But, <laughs> but I, I, I'm going to stop talking altogether. I have a question for Zach, if okay. that's OK. Yeah. Um, Zach, I, I loved your talk. I thought it was so interesting. Um, I'm, I'm curious about if, if some of the arguments you make about sort of alternate, alternative um, societies and times um, has to be specifically associated with red power or it could be associated with other countercultural movements at the time or movements for you know um, racial liberation, that kind of thing. Um, I, I think that's an interesting question and um, also, I don't know if you're familiar with Vonnegut's uh, player piano all that much, but if you're interested in Vonnegut and sort of red power and stuff, that might be a really interesting book to look at because at one point, you know, the giant corporation has a retreat on former Native American grounds and a, um, it's this sort of this sort of sad Native American guy comes out and gives this sort of phony spiritual, quasi-spiritual speech. It's a big send up of that. So it, it's very specifically addressed in that book, which was his first novel, which, you know, th that might be just something interesting to, to, to look at if you're, if you're continuing this work. Yeah, what year was Player Piano? Um, 1952, is that right, Tom, Nicole? Somewhere around there. 52, 50. Some, somewhere around there, Tom. Do you have a definitive? We have the technology. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah, I mean, I guess I can Google it. I can Google it later too. But uh, the it, the thing that struck me about this kind of coincidental research that I was uncovering is that it, the thing that always kind of kept me from exploring it any further in writing um, at the time of my dissertation, anyway, was that I couldn't find anything that I thought was concrete enough to link the two texts in any sort of 
truly persuasive way. There's a lot of sort of uh, ambient discussion going on in the 60s that I think lends itself to potentially influence on Vonnegut. I, I found, you know, Klinkowitz writes about his uh, proposed thesis, mm -hmm. um, which I think is definite proof of his at least interest in things like organized indigenous resistance. Um, I haven't looked at Clear Piano, but if it is 52, then it's squarely in the middle of the termination era. And so it would make a lot of sense for him to have this kind of character come out and give a cardboard speech. Um, and so I'll most certainly look at it. Um, and, but I was thinking about, um, in, kind of in response back to the question about the Dresden numbers, um, ironically enough, I also looked into the Dresden stuff back when I was looking at Slaughterhouse Five. Um, and I'm not sure if you've read um, Jonathan Stafford Fowler's Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, um, but also a remembrance of Dresden. Um, and I, I think the thing that strikes me about the two um, novels together, along with the kind of arguments about Irving's numbers and numbers about Dresden, if I remember correctly, Rigney is writing in the context of like a German argument or an argument within Germany about these kinds of issues. Um, is the, the difference between the political expediency of the felt experience of living in and through something and the political expediency of abstraction on the other hand, right? And I think in the context of Vietnam, abstraction was beginning to cause everyday folks like Pilgrim, or at least that's the way I would read him, to begin to ignore or tune out the numbers because they became too kind of daily you know, if you see body counts in the 2000s every day, it becomes impossible to think about that as meaningful after a while, right? It's that people, you know, it's that people are dying thing, which reminds me of the, the argument that Brian was making that, you know, there, Vonnegut says, I think that there's nothing intelligent to say about a massacre. Um, and I think I don't, it feels wrong to say it, but it's kind of true. And I think in, when we think about that with respect to the relationship between Vonnegut and indigenous protest. Um, I don't know, I mean, in terms of what that might mean for looking at alternative um, sort of modes of living outside the context of red power. Um, I think at the time there was a sort of movements from all corners of finding ways to find alternatives to the status quo. Um, and so, I guess circling all the way back in a very rambling way, um, I don't think it's limited just to red power. It's just that for me, that has been a very, I think almost not at all treated um, potential context within which to situate Vonnegut's work at this time. Um, but um, have there been, does anyone know if there've been other readings looking at Vonnegut as a kind of uh, utopian futurist with respect to Slaughterhouse-Five? I, I don't recall coming across too much, but. I mean, I think there's a, a, a lot of um, people have talked about Vonnegut as sort of a failed utopian dreamer. Mm. Um, you know, Vonnegut imagines these utopias, but they almost always fail. But nevertheless, he still admires the people that, you know, sort of push these utopian ideas and he supports them, even though he sort of also throws up his hands and says, you know, they're not going to work. Uh, <laughs> This is sort of a bad place, and you know we're not going to get better. But there's a lot of there's a lot of emphasis right now within new indigenous literature for this kind of future utopia, and a lot of ha things happening in science fiction right now and speculative fiction. Um, and I can see a lot of lines from from Vonnegut to what's happening there, right, in terms of influence among other writers. Um, so I don't know. I, I wonder if that cynicism was felt by Vonnegut or if it was part of the critique his novels presented. And I know, I know the public persona of Vonnegut is often very cynical, but I don't know if that's, I don't know. I just have to wonder I, about, you know, the difference between like, a Vonnegut utopian or 
quasi utopian, you know, dystopian, what <laughs> sometimes you can't really tell the difference um, world, right? And, and, and like a, a native futurism and, and like an Afro futurism, right? So uh, in other words, there's, there's sort of a different base uh, racial worldview that is, I think you have to consider if you're working through the way that these sort of uh, sci-fi futures, you know, uh, that could be conceived as utopias are, are functioning in literature. Mm -hmm. um, but I, abs I know absolutely nothing about the, the native literature that you're talking about, Zach, so I could be like way off base in what I'm saying. Um, but I guess I would wonder your response to, to what I'm saying here. You know, hmm. how, how do you think that the identities of the authors would, would play into those visions? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think there's absolutely an important distinction to be made between um, like indigenous futurism from authors from specific tribal contexts, right? And then what Vonnegut would be able to imagine um, from his own background and, and its various limitations. Um, but I guess I was thinking in terms of the sort of, to me, it seems like there's a lot of influence in the ways Vonnegut represents um, a kind of critical version of a failed utopia um, that's failed primarily because it's a failure of his character's imagination, if that makes sense. Right? And I think it's that sort of meta layer that to me suggests he's at least critical of the limits of his own kind of worldview. Um, and that if I, so if I were going to make the argument, right, that Vonnegut is critical of settler society, I, I would say it's because of that meta layer of, of being critical of the limitations of his character's worldview as reflective of his character's, the limitations of his character's imagination of what could be. And if we look at indigenous science fiction today as an imagination of what else could be, um, among the baseline kind of conditions of what is now are those tribally specific contexts, but also the extant reality of settler colonialism, right? In which anyone in North America lives. And so um, I think there are, you know, some generative lines to be drawn between the two novels while being respectful of the differences, if that addresses your question. It certainly does. And I just, I'm just constantly thinking about those sorts of things. Um, yeah. My, my, my talk was, would have been thinking race with Vonnegut. So, mm. you know, mm -hmm. I, I just can't help but ask those kinds of questions. Um, so yeah, I didn't mean it to be like, Oh, no, no. You better think about this. <laughs> In, wait, I want to read this comment. In actual reality, dystopia stands. So we need, I lost the chat. Mm. We need utopia in virtual reality. Do you want to, do you want to say a little bit more about that, Angie? Oh, yes. Uh, if you want to see why we have so-called utopia, it must be so-called a uh, disillusion to the situation that it can be a, a being recognized as uh, life experiences of dysautopia. Because the dysautopia stands in your life story. So you have so-called maybe online games or Facebook, that kind of stuff to create another virtual reality for you as a kind of personal utopia. And the personal utopia will influence other people's uh, impression. And then partially it will cover the this utopia, uh, nobody, that kind of uh, fi uh, feeling. So that's exactly what Vonnegut want to do. He is actually a uh, nobody in in a real uh, World War II, but at, at least in his uh, Slaughterhouse Five, he can create really uh, 
this guy as uh, maybe parody of Jesus as God. And then this kind of utopia become their Bonego standout through those uh, dead and maybe frustrating uh, Second World War experiences and the death of her mother, right? So actually it's a kind of revolt to yourself to create a utopia. So actually in actual reality, Bonego is very successful. So that's why we are gathered together talking to him. So it works, utopia works, but not in the madhouse, it's under in literature, yeah. Angie, can I actually ask you a question? Oh, sure, sure. I thought it was really interesting how you talked briefly about the extraterrestrial as a way for um, both Billy and the Trial Famidorians to kind of evaluate the human experience and get almost a closer and almost dissecting look into humanity. But at the same time, you also talked about his connection to PTSD. And I know that uh, many scholars believe that Trial Famidor was almost a form of escapism that branched off of that post-traumatic stress. And I wonder whether you see Trial Famidor as, I guess, more in that realm of escape or more as a way to actually look closer at humanity and on what level, maybe like at the character level, it's escape, but at the authorial level, it's evaluative, kind of how did you reconcile those contradictions in your Trouble, research? Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, Travel model is a so-called pro structure of the fantasy to the madman according to the uh, setting of Von Ego's hand. So, so when you see what is so-called travel model and why people doesn't believe in travel model, why people believe in Harry Potter, because Harry Potter is a successful structure, right? But travel model obviously is a poor structure. Every man can realize it's dysfunctional. No one will love this uh, story, no one. And everyone knows it's just a, a, a so-called, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to say that. I don't want to use any uh, mental, words, but uh, words uh, to judge this, but it is a poor structure of uh, travel though, under the setting of Vonego's hand, hands of beating. But everyone, everyone, I think every writers, before they published, they all have so-called some kind of poor structure before. So maybe that kind of poor structure, that kind of draft is actually the reflection of Bonego, he himself become a, a major in literature writer. He, his life experiences, he has lots of this kinds of trauma model experiences. And then one day it matured and it became a totally, maybe he got lots of more real experiences and it became a so-called, it can a metaphor to artificial intelligence, yeah, right? So you can employ with that to artificial intelligence. Even Bonego, he himself didn't view that, but it became a literary prophecy. And that is, that makes the poor structure become a prophecy that's really interesting. For example, you can see George Orwell's 1984, that, that is, that is also another trouble, trouble model. And in my part, this is like a prophecy for AI, artificial intelligence, but it's on, on the hand, on the viewpoint of ET, yeah, at that time. That's great, thank you. Zach, um, I'm, I'm sorry if we, <laughs> this is really interesting. I hope you're not trying to stop us like in the next minute, Tom, but um, Zach, I was really interested in, I, I mean, not Zach, I'm sorry, Brian, I meant to say, Zach, I 
I had a question for you earlier, but Brian, I keep calling you Zach. Um, um, I was really interested when you talked about the fact that teaching Ellie Wiesel's night tends to reify the Holocaust um, and that sort of putting Vonnegut as, uh, next to it maybe subtracts some of that. Um, it, but I wondered if you could even talk more. I mean, you, you, you directed us to some exercises that are online, these sort of, you, you called it, I think, um, a sort of false empathic connection. Um, I, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that, because I, th I thought some of those ideas were really, really fascinating. And, you know, I've talked about both Knight and Slaughterhouse, and I uh, would be curious to hear more about some of these problems um, with the way that you think Knight is taught. It's a... Uh... So it's interesting. So the, the two activities that I mentioned are, are fairly horrific. So I'll sort of briefly explain them. Uh, the cattle car activity is, again, for those of you who have, who have read Night, uh, there's the famous uh, chapter with Mrs. Schachter in the cattle car. Uh, and what you're supposed to do is take a sort of painter's tape and mark out a very specific uh, amounts of space on the floor of your classroom and have all your students just stand in it. And that's supposed to make it seem like, okay, now you know exactly what it's like in the cattle car. Uh, the other thing is the, the Anne Frank activity, uh, which has been on sort of several sort of news stations as being really bad. Uh, but essentially it's, you have all your students, uh, basically it's like a, a horrific game of, of, yeah, man, for sure. It's really bad. Uh, it's like a bad game of red light, green light, the Anne Frank thing. So you have your students walk around and then when you tell them to stop, they're not allowed to move or make any noise for a certain amount of time. The idea being that, okay, now you know exactly what it's like to be Anne Frank. And it's this kind of very troublesome idea of trying to create connection with these characters or these people, but in a way that really diminishes the actual experience. Um, now, it, the other thing I think with, with Knight uh, that I've run into, and so again, like I said, this comes out of a much bigger project where I looked at sort of curricula around the country. Um, Knight is frequently just taught in memoir units um, as being a, a mentor text. So students are supposed to read a memoir about the Holocaust and use that as a model for their own writing, which I, I see, I saw Zach make a weird face. I'm with him. It's, it's a little bit off. Um, and so it's this real sense of like taking the Holocaust and diminishing it or taking it and really just focusing on things that happened in the camps rather than as a really sort of extensive historical event that had precedence beforehand, had di like distinct things during it, and then afterwards, like still dealing with the effects of that. Um, so it's really troubling, I think, how Knight is, is taught uh, because it's not really taught, I think, with honor to the, the victims of the Holocaust or to really just sort of World War II as an event. Uh, so it's really, really troubling. Um, I don't know if that answers your, your, your question, but it, it's worrying to me. I think a, I think a lot of high school is, is worrying and that's, that is not a critique of you, Brian. I just, you know. <laughs> it's a troubling place for sure. It's a very troubling place. <laughs> Academically, socially, it's troubling. Um, so, so kudos to you for, I don't know if I could do it. Um, okay, well, so we are, we are over what we would have had time for uh, were we meeting in person. And luckily no one from the Kate Chopin Society is pounding at our door. Um, but uh, I, I think that we had, we had a, a fruitful discussion. I wanna thank everyone uh, for, for sharing their thoughts. Thank you, Megan, for, for joining us. Um, and uh, if, if everyone or anyone, I guess, any or everyone is around um, at 4 p.m. 
Tom, is that correct? Uh, we, we have a panel of which Megan is a part. Tom, you wanna say a couple things about that before we close out? Uh, it is the more traditional panel. This one was a little bit more free form because we had uh, shorter papers that were accepted into it, but the other paper, uh, other panel will have a more extended uh, discussions of particular topics of which, uh, as you mentioned, Megan will be a part. So that's very exciting. Uh, we'd happy be happy to have all of you there again. If you want to, I should have readied the link and I could have dropped it in there, but you'll all lose it when it when you close your Zoom window anyway. But if anyone's interested in coming by, you're welcome to uh, just kick me an email quickly and I'll send it to you. I think I've been sending people the correct links, but they all start to blur together after a while. That said, um, if anybody does have any interest in uh, officially joining the organization, we do not coerce you into joining the organization when you present for us. Uh, I'd be happy to add you to our membership roles. We're undertaking a big, uh, mailing list development, which is very exciting. Uh, and if any of you, he says, speaking out to the electronic ether are watching this at home after the fact, watching our recording, uh, we would also be happy to have you be a part of our organization. Please do feel free to email me at vonnegutsociety at gmail.com. We'd be delighted to have you be a part of our uh, very free form, but I'd like to think jovial organization. I, I would agree, and I just want to add one final thing, which is uh, that the Vonnegut Society will also be uh, at the Northeast Modern Language Association. Um, that will take place in March of 20, what year are we in? 24, uh, 2022, I see I can't, I don't know when, what, what, what year we're in, but the, this coming March and um, we have a session there, and if you are interested in submitting anyone here or who might perchance be watching later, um, submissions for that will be due uh, at the end of September, I believe. So yeah, if you're interested in that, you know, another opportunity to join, join us in Vonnegut Scholarship. All right. So yeah, I think, I think that, is, that is it. Thank you very much. And lovely to hear all your thoughts on our friend. Thank Bob. you.